I like that. I like all the electronics there. It kind of gives you sort of a a spiritual buzz too. In counseling, there's a modality that you use um, as a counselor that you think about. It's called stages of change. And there's five stages of change. I'm not going to talk about all five. I just want to talk about the first two stages. And the first stage of change uh, is um, it's not a stage of change, actually. It's pre-contemplation. So your job as a counselor is as you get to know someone to try and figure out in your own mind where they, where they fall in terms of stages of change, and then you try and, and try and do your work from that standpoint. And so the first one is pre-contemplation. And what that looks like is, you know, <clears throat> maybe everybody around somebody is saying, you know, hey, something here really needs to change. I'm not very happy. Your life's not working really well, whatever it is. And the person that, that everyone's unhappy with is kind of oblivious, <laughs> you know? And so we ask ourselves a question because we're not saying that people are unintelligent or that people are evil or anything. It's like, what's that all about? What it comes down to in the first, in the first stage of, in terms of uh, pre-contemplation is the word no. I wonder if you ever thought about that. In whatever, whatever we all face in our lives, whatever challenge that is. In whatever way we are called to move forward, to evolve, to grow, to change. If that is not happening, it comes down to that simple little two-letter word, no. And so as a counselor, if, if your job is to assist, you know, you want to try and unlock that word, talk about that word. And you want to gently nudge them to the little three-letter word of yes. Can we go from no to yes? So interesting how how we will cling to no with our white knuckles. Can I take that no away from you? Can you give it to me? Please? Can we talk about your no? Can you hand it over? No. So then you want to move into contemplation, which is honestly to open up and say, yeah, maybe change is possible. Maybe change should take place. And that's where you go into yes. And the rest of the stages of change are how you someone would fine-tune the yes. With all this rainy weather we've had recently, and then we have these really beautiful days in between. <clears throat> there was one day where we had some rainy weather, <clears throat> and it had cleared up and um, into the evening. And so, um, and I, I think I took the garbage out that night or something. And I was out in the street when I put it. I was getting it out there for the next morning, and and uh, there was a moon out, and there were some stars breaking through the clouds. It was gorgeous. There was that that heavy moisture in the air, you know, cl- clean, cl- clean feeling, and that cleansed earth. And I I looked at the you know, up there at the at the moon and the stars, and it was really great. And so I went to bed that night, and I, cr- I opened my window up, and my window is very close to my bed, and so I was laying there um, before I fell asleep. And up above in the sky somewhere, there was coming down this sound that is as old as maybe the earth. And uh, it was some variety of a group of geese going over. And I was listening to their honking. And apparently they were low enough to where, for a little bit, I could hear their wings as well, the honking and the wings, you know. And they were just kind of, so they had just, you know, they were somewhere and they were going somewhere. And I was thinking about that in listening to them. You know, there's something beautiful about that sound and, as a lot of you know who are familiar with my, my speaking, I, I tend to have a nostalgic side to me about nature. I, I just find nature to be so, you know, I, loved, I love nature as a guidance. I mean, you know, like, like let's just, you know, like, like, like a possum just knows it's a possum. You know what I'm saying? I mean, they're not freaked out about do they look good or uh, I would rather be a raccoon. I'm not sure who I am. I... You know, I, I have a lot of so low self-esteem about being a possum. Yeah, they're just they're just a frickin' possum. I just 
I love that, you know, they don't have the mental health issues that we have, you know, the, the identity crisis and stuff, you know. So I, I, I think about nature a lot, and I'm drawn to the lessons of nature and the guidance of nature. And, and I was listening to that ancient sound go over. They were somewhere, and they're going somewhere. And so I kind of I kind of back I, I, I back that up in my mind, and I thought about, you know, they're flying over, but where were they when they started? And what got them going? What got their motor running, right? What made them decide, okay, boys and girls, it's time to go, you know, and we're heading out. And um, I would imagine that, see, every individual honk I heard was a goose that said, yes, it's time to go, okay. You know, yeah, the food here has been good, I'm relaxed, it's been nice to kind of not be beating my wings for a while, you know. Oh, it's time to go. Okay. I love that. I love that resignation. Yeah, I'm, I'm all in, you know? Wouldn't it be great to have clients like that? <laughs> they walk through the door. Okay, let's change. Yeah, let's. You're somewhere. You're going somewhere. Let, yeah, okay, sign me up. Let me start beating my wings. Let me start honking, you know? Ernest Holmes says, um, an active proclamation of yes produces an active condition of an affirmative movement forward. That's so elegant. It's so simple. Uh, an ele- you know, a movement forward. I've been reading a book for a while. Um, I read slow sometimes. And uh, the gentleman who wrote the book was called John, his name is John Blofeld. He's no longer with us. This is an old book I found in a used bookstore, and it's been really wonderful. And the, the, book, the title of the book is simply Taoism, and I love it. It's an overview of Taoism and gets into the ancient ideas and the folklore and everything else. He talked about, um, he talked about a teaching within Taoism that's very metaphorical, that's, that's very theological. It's great. And he said, the great masters and seekers are climbing onto the backs of dragons that would appear and ride them to the mountaintop or onto the vast clouds of pink and turquoise or onto the moon. Now, this is just dripping with some ideas in it. First of all, a dragon. This is not the, the, the family dog. You know what I'm saying? This is not a, a, an Irish setter that comes in and lays at your feet and licks your face and maybe sleeps with you and is is mellow and stuff. I'm going to get on the back of a dragon. Wow. A a huge reptile with whiskers and scales and maybe a bad attitude and maybe breathing fire, you know, whatever that is. I'm going to get onto the back of a dragon. When that dragon, so in other words, the masters teach when the dragon shows up, you say yes. You know what's really interesting? If we think about that in terms of stages of change, a lot of times, yes looks like a dragon to us. And when we see the dragon, we run the other way because it's scary. Yes is scary. People don't, people don't choose yes because, again, they're, they're unintelligent or bad people. They, choose, they don't choose yes because it's scary. And so the masters, these, and this is the deal, great religious theological masters. So what do we think? Oh, great teachers. These guys are knowledgeable and they're wise and they're wisdom. And so, and so the next question is, how did they gain their wisdom? How did they gain their knowledge? They've been, they've been riding dragons around. And see, because it says, whenever the dragon appears, you climb on the back of the dragon and you move on. And when we think of things like mountaintops and these beautiful clouds and the imagery and, and to the moon, you know, what, what does that represent? These incredible wisdoms and insights, these incredible directions that we can go. Imagine a, a mountaintop, the, you know, what, you, what your vision would tell you about things, about being able to see 
I remember there, there's, a, there's a Taoist teaching that, see, that says, Though, those, who, those who stand on the mountaintop are not surprised by the future. Isn't that great? Those who are on a mountaintop are not surprised by the future. Why? Because we can see. And so if we think about the mountaintops or in the clouds or the moon, imagine the, 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 the vista of the moon. Imagine the vista of the clouds, what we can see or not see, and what we can learn and not learn. I mean, isn't that really the, isn't that really the driving force of change and evolution and growth is this idea of being able to truly see what's going on. Within every religious tradition, you know, I talk about earlier, I talk about where are you in this and how we, speak, we teach spirituality, not religious constructs. Within all of the spiritual wisdom, within all the spiritual wisdom is this idea of mindfulness, insight, seeing, awareness. So what makes the great masters the great masters? There are people who have been riding the dragons to places where they can see the awareness. And so the yes becomes a... The other, the other part of it, too, is that when you get on that dragon, you're not sure where you're going. You might go to the mountain, you might go to the clouds, you might go to the moon. And so saying yes means to accept, to open, to allow. This has been, I believe, probably one of the oldest themes in all of spirituality. Because, and the reason I think that is because this is the oldest conundrum challenge, construct, that I think has been evidenced within our species, human beings, and all of our different, you know, cousins and who were along with us, you know, the homo, you know, the, the Neanderthals and all those kind of people who were up with us who eventually all came together and became us. I think we've been dealing with this for a long time. There's been a time, I think it was recently I spoke here and I, and I got off on the, uh, on the cave paintings in France. I, I'm, I'm just absolutely mesmerized. I, I love petroglyphs and stuff. I love that stuff. And we got some great ones here in the United States. But in France, there's these incredible caves with these cave paintings and with these herds of animals and all the kinds of animals. And Joseph Campbell talks about the fact that, you know, when you go in there, you know, if, I've, I've never been there, obviously, but, you know, if you go in there, it's just absolutely pitch black. It's a huge cavern. And so our ancestors went in there and they, and they created a fire on the floor and they would get up there and somehow they would get up there high and they used all the pigmentations that they had at the time and they, they, would, they would design all these animals and some of them are solitary, some of them are in herds, some of them are moving, some of them are not. It's just breathtaking. It's amazing. And, and I've, I've, been ca I've been captivated by that because Joseph Campbell said that he, he said that Basically, he saw this, this, this idea of our ancestors doing that in this cave as being they wanted to be in the birthplace of nature. They wanted to inhabit that place of God. Think of it in terms of, say, the feminine energy of birthing, the absolute birthing place, right? And those who study, the, the, those who study plants from an anthropological point of view, they talk about when you look at when you look at the world many, many hundreds, thousands of years ago, there, were, there was all kinds of grasslands in every region, whether it was what's now called Africa or the Americas or Europe or, or Asia, all these grasslands. And so today, today we can still look at the grasslands of Africa and we call it the Serengeti where the herd animals move up and down through the seasons and through the grazing. And that seems to be the, the heartbeat of life in that place, moving up and moving back and moving up. And there's a rainy season and a dry season. And so that becomes the rhythm of life. So you can imagine that in those, in those cave walls, imagine that those are the grasslands and those are the animals. And yes is intertwined in that narrative. What do I mean by that? Every morning, just like the geese, they have to get up and say, yes, we're moving forward. They allow, you know, Ernest Holmes talks about in, in his work the, the divine urge. And we know that with, with animal life and stuff, there's a lot of 
a lot of biology to it and those kinds of things, but there's also that divine urge, what we've been doing for a long time, to say yes to the next thing, yes to the next season, yet, y yes to the next miles that we have to go. There's a woman named Alicia Du Plessis, I hope I'm saying that right. She's an author and art history expert, and she says about the cave paintings, all through the cave, spattered throughout the images of the animals, there are geometric markings, dots and lines. There are also two unidentified drawings with a butterfly or bird-like appearance to them. This confluence of topics has prompted some prehistoric era scholars to assume these murals have a ceremonial, mystical, and magical element to them. Imagine those people, what their life was like. I mean, from sun up to sun down, they were trying to survive at that time in history. And yet, they took the time to go into a cave and enter into a spiritual idea. What were the herd animals teaching them? What are the geese teaching us? What are the dragons teaching us? I want to combine here uh, something. I want to combine a quote from Ernest Holmes and Charles Fillmore. In that order, I combine them together. I don't think they would mind, okay? Uh, Ernest Holmes is the founder of this movement. Charles F Fillmore was a co-founder of Unity. In accordance with our spiritual selves, we must allow yes to become known within our conscious consciousness. Consciousness being, you know, how we operate mentally, spiritually. To be conscious of that, right? Be, to be known within our conscious consciousness. For to affirm is to hold steadfast the consciousness to speak and accept a higher truth. That's what yes opens up to us, a higher truth. If you are challenged and you're hanging on to no, if you have a loved one who's hanging on to no, the trick is to offer up some form of a higher truth that they can say yes to. That's what yes is about. That's the power of yes. So I have a question I'm going to leave you with today to take into the social hall. Do what you want with it. So this is the question that I'm going to end with. We all know the metaphor of the butterfly construct. You know, start out as a caterpillar, eating all the time, eating your weight every... Wouldn't that be great? I mean, just... Like hanging out and just eating, right? Just getting just as heavy as you can because you know you're going to be heading into the chamber here pretty soon, right? So we all know the metaphor. The caterpillar surrenders into the cocoon and later becomes the butterfly. So this is the question I want to leave you with. Within the butterfly metaphor, where is the most powerful yes? Leaving the cocoon or entering it? So, so, so mull that over, all right? All right. Thank you very much, you guys.